Jan Stein. Join me as I do interviews with leaders in the field of artificial intelligence from across the world. We speak about the business relevance of artificial intelligence and we also speak about the future. Is it to be feared or to be embraced? Please subscribe at my website for updates on future interviews. Every morning, over a warm cup of coffee, like most of you, I scan my favorite news sites and social media feeds so that I'm aware of what's going on in the world. But have you ever stopped to wonder if someone or something is manipulating the news you see? Do we really think that our view of the world is shaped independently of outside influence? My guest today is Ansgar Kuhn who is the Global AI Ethics and Regulatory Leader at EY. Ansgar's work focuses on computational neuroscience and on computational social science. We spoke about topics such as algorithmic accountability and transparency, recommender systems and whether our opinions are formed through design. We also spoke about his work in academia at the University of Nottingham, the International Organization for Securities Commission, the European AI Alliance, the IEEE Algorithmic Bias Considerations Working Group, and the European Commission. This was a very informative discussion for me, and I am sure that you will also find it interesting and illuminating. Ansgar, thank you so much for joining us. There's a, a lot of things I want to talk about. I love your profile on, on the internet and on LinkedIn. question I often ask people, we meet at a dinner party, and I ask you, so what do you do for a living? <laughs> how would you answer that question? Um, I'd say I look at how AI and other emerging technologies in the digital space, how they are impacting on society, and how we can make sure that they get used in a responsible way. It sounds so simple, but it's such a lot of things that you've actually just alluded to and so important. Um, on your profile, you talk about computational neuroscience and human behavior research. And I would love to start there because I'm certainly far from an expert in those fields, but I think my interest in AI is more what it's doing to us and going to do to us than the technology itself. And I often think about the future of my own son who is six years old. You know, what world are we leaving for him and for his children? So tell us what is computational neuroscience? I think we kind of know what those two words mean separately. But when we bring it together, what does that mean? Sure. So that really refers to the path that I've taken from starting off in electrical engineering control systems, very much an engineering approach to um, how we can use technology to improve things for us, um, to where I am now in a more policy and ethics kind of space. And that pathway has gone from, as I said, starting in the engineering space, working on fuzzy logic and artificial neural networks to try and use the fuzzy kind of way of describing things like in uh, you'd say it's hot as opposed to saying it's 32 degrees centigrade because that's more of a natural human way of thinking of things. But using that kind of fuzzy way of thinking about things, formulate, formalizing that in uh, a computational way and then seeing whether we can use that to extract meaning from neural networks. The reason I'm going into a bit of detail on this is because even though this was work I was doing in the late 90s, sort of in the previous wave of AI, it is very current again, the question of how can we make trans, you know, explainable what these models are that are actually being learned. So from there, I started actually being interested more in how do humans also understand the world based on the experience that they have with their surroundings. And that really led me from looking at artificial systems to how the human brain is working. So computational neuroscience is basically the way of computationally looking at the brain. So not so much interested in where are things located in the brain. Frankly, with an engineering background, um, I don't really know where things are in the brain. I just know something about their functions. I was focusing on 
the control of eye movements, for instance. I know that the superior colliculus is a brainstem area that does uh, a kind of a mapping. Certain act activities in a certain part of that map generate an eye movement of a certain kind. Um, I have no real idea where that is in the space, but functionally I know what that is. So computational neuroscience is looking at the function functional aspects of the brain and how can we computationally model them and then it again makes the connection with ai because ai when we're talking about deep neural networks for instance there's often talk about how it is like the brain well as somebody who's worked more also on the neuroscience side of things i like to say it's inspired by the brain same as we would say with uh transition from a novel to a movie where the movie diverges quite a bit but it's still inspired by it. Um, deep neural networks are inspired by the brain in the sense that it uses multiple layers of processing but the actual brain is far more complicated. The types of processing that happen even a single neuron are vastly more complicated than what we're doing in an artificial neural network. But so basically we were, the approach that we were trying to do is apply our knowledge from engineering to see whether our concepts of how the different parts of the brain function, uh, whether those actually make sense by trying to recreate that in, in a computational model. So things like biologically inspired robotics or doing some uh, simple robotic models of a rat, for instance, to try to replicate what the actual rat was doing in order to see whether our understanding of how action selection in the basic ganglia works actually can be operationalized in a system. That leads me to my next question. As you were explaining, because I find it fascinatingly interesting, what is the practical application in the everyday lives of human beings of, of the work that you are doing? So um, the, the work that I'm currently doing uh, as I said, I've actually migrated somewhat from the computational neuroscience work into more of a policy space. Uh, and that was a migration that happened through looking at data sharing, actually, within the, the research community. Uh, things like the neuroinformatics framework, which was sharing on electrophysiological data and fMRI kinds of data, to thinking, well, we should also be sharing the behavioral data, which led to looking at computational social science, uh, which is doing a lot of using online kind of data to try and generate models of how humans behave, which then led to thinking about the ethical questions about using data in ways that are completely different from what you may have originally thought about when you put that data out there. For instance, people analyzing Twitter data to, you know, do linguistic studies is very interesting. Um, but if you were just you know, generating a stream of tweets over a couple of years, you weren't thinking, oh, somebody's going to start picking those up and actually track everything I've said over multiple years to generate a kind of model of how I uh, communicate with the world. Uh, am I actually happy with somebody doing that? Especially if we think about how this kind of uh, assessments has led to things like Cambridge Analytica finding ways to nudge people, to manipulate them without them completely being aware of it and those kinds of things. Mm. So really, through that kind of journey, coming to the questions about how are the our AI systems actually shaping the way we experience the world, um, things like recommender systems, search engines, hardly anybody looks past the first page of search results. Um, so the way in which search results get ranked dramatically shapes which parts of the web we actually see, which shapes the way in which we experience the world, who has agency over these kinds of things. So that's where the whole ethics, data ethics, AI ethics comes in play. And so how does this directly impact on people, on all of us? Well, it impacts on the question about how should these things be regulated? How much should we be leaving completely open so that we can explore and have the creativity for innovation without um, undue restrictions? But where does it come into the, the, the border where it starts to have significant impacts on people when you actually need to be thinking about what are the long-term consequences? I mean, if we, if we look at um, 
problems that have arisen, arisen with these types of technologies. Frequently, what we see is because people who started developing them, they had a particular idea of how the technology should be used, which would lead to beneficial outcomes. And they didn't think beyond, but wait a minute, what if somebody else uses it for something slightly different? What if it gets applied in a different context than the one that I was building it for? Or, as in the case with a lot of the bias issues, uh, what if this system gets applied to somebody who isn't just like me and uh, therefore has a different kind of background context and therefore the kinds of ways that I thought decisions should be made by the system might not be properly applicable to. So it's really challenging, you know, when do we need to be doing this deep thinking of what are the implications going to be of the systems that we build before we put them out there or perhaps even before we really get into building the systems um, so that we can avoid unintended consequences. Mm. You made me think now, I, years back I heard the best, in my view, um, definition of democracy, and that was that it's the engineering of consent. Um, so it's something to think about. Now, you know, while you were talking, so every morning I've got my ritual, I get up quite early, I make my cup of coffee, and I scan the, my favorite news channels, and I think of myself as a totally independent, neutral agent looking at what's thrown at me, but it's not, I'm not independent and I'm not neutral. And it's, it's, the, it's not without design, which shapes my opinion and the opinion of millions of people. So it is quite scary if you think of it. I mean, we've got the American election coming up in November if, if they don't postpone it <laughs> or if, if the president doesn't postpone it. But it just makes you wonder. I mean, I think the media has always played a role in forming opinion, but it is now so in our faces and it's so, it's, it learns what, from our behavior, what will best change our opinion. So it is almost actually really scary if, if you think of it. We, so if we talk about the future in the next 10 or 20 years, and if we perhaps don't regulate this, where do you see this going? So I think one of the things that is really scary in the way in which these systems are operating now compared to the way in which um, we've always had editors choosing what comes on the front page of the media, etc. is that these recommender systems, etc., have been introduced by stealth almost. They've been introduced into these systems to make it easier for us to make, uh, you know, give us the results that we feel are more relevant to us, however that might be defined. Um, without there being any discussion, and especially without there being any recognition as to the editorial responsibility that actually comes with being the person that's building and deploying these systems. And so we've had a disconnect between the existing concepts of where uh, accountability lies for the types of information that are coming out and, and how these technologies are actually being used. So, and. But that is something that the current last couple of years of discussion, starting from data privacy and then gradually moving into questions like um, uh, loss of agency, the need for transparency, um, those, that, that discussion has been developing. And we've seen this, for instance, with the recent uh, AI white paper from the European Commission, which has directly been talking about, you know, how do we identify what are high risk kind of applications and how should those be regulated. And, and the European Commission is still far from actually doing the regulating. Um, it's still a long process of democratic discussion between different parties, um, but the discussion is happening and that is something that gives me hope and, and I continue contributing to that. If we didn't have this, if we were to simply be continue to uh, implement these types of systems and basically gradually erode away a lot of the existing safeguards that we had by saying, well, it's, uh, it's an automated system. The system as such has no uh, agenda and therefore we'll just assume that it is neutral and objective um, because we ignore the fact that, of course, it is constructed by people who naturally have um, agendas and opinions, same as all of us do. So we, we basically, we run the risk 
of sleepwalking into a area where a few, a very few number of organizations who are the ones actually creating these systems have increasing levels of power over how we experience the world, how we shape our understanding of the world, um, and ultimately our agency of being uh, a person as opposed to just a cog in a, in a machine for generating more revenue for these few um, organizations. And your, if I may say, your, your day job is with EY, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, um, yes. So, so I assume is that uh, a advisory kind of a role? So maybe just take us through what you do with EY, and, and I assume you're working with consulting with customers and, and maybe government. Um, so just take us through that if you don't mind, Ansgar. Sure. So I um, I'm the global AI ethics and regulatory leader for EY, which means uh, the global part means I'm part of uh, EY Global, sort of, which is more of an internal function that helps set uh, strategy and governance frameworks, etc., for the firm globally, because EY operates at various different national EYs have lots of independence. Um, and as such, my role is largely around uh, shaping how are we going to do governance of AI systems that are being constructed and used internally in EY, but it's also to do with how do we engage with clients who are interested in taking on board an, an AI system? Uh, for instance, developing a toolkit to help um, the, move along the conversation about, okay, you wanted to int introduce, you know, automate part of your system with, with machine learning. Um, what are the implications for the um, regulatory compliance? What are the implications for oversight within this? How do we make sure that this system um, remains in sync with the ethos that you as an organization are having? And so EY doesn't try to uh, prescribe what values uh, companies should be having, but rather uh, provide a structured way of thinking through what the implications are going to be of introducing an AI system and a structured way of asking the questions, have you actually thought of what the ethical implications are going to be? You've decided to optimize for this certain value. What is your justification for that? If you were to be challenged on this, how would you be able to say why you thought it was better to um, optimize for uh, maximum value for some uh, stakeholders as opposed to, to uh, optimize for um, best average value across stakeholders or something like that. Um, so on the one hand, it's helping the teams that are doing the direct client engagements by providing them these types of toolkits, but also another big part is uh, public policy engagement. So I, I work with the global public policy team doing things like responding to the European Commission's AI white paper, responding to um, data privacy bills that have been floated in the US Congress, um, and similar to those kinds of things. We are recently engaging with the International Organization for Securities Commissions, um, which is developing guidelines for the financial sector around the use of AI systems, for instance. So it's, it's basically a, about um, helping translate, really, AI principle, ethics principles, which Everybody currently has a set of those, or if they don't, you could pick one out of 200 that have been published. Um, but how do you translate those high-level principles into practical application within your organization? And that can be either within EY or for a client, or in a sense, um, in, for, for governments. Mm. I think it's so important, um, everything that you've just said, Ansgar, because I think, and when you talk about regulation and compliance, I, I can only assume a, a big chunk of the work is in banking and financial services, for instance. Um, I think often the intent of introducing AI and what practically happens on the ground in project delivery is not always connected, um, especially from a, from a, you mentioned ethos or, or ethics point of view. And um, it's often a technology-led conversation, and I don't think it should be. It should be a people-led conversation. And um, ethics and all these things we're talking about, I think, organizations jump in with their best tech, technical smart people 
and they start doing this without having thought through it. So I think that kind of an advisory role that you're talking about now is imperatively important um, for any organization before they just buy some AWS tech or Microsoft tech and they get going. I think you were part, and you're no longer part of the European AI Alliance, but you're still doing work with from an EU point of view. Um, what is the AI Alliance and is that still active? So the AI Alliance was uh, created uh, at the same time as the high level expert group on AI, uh, which is basically an initiative by the European Commission to uh, get a better understanding of how different stakeholders, be it industry or academia or civil society, um, what their perspectives are on uh, the uses of AI. So the initial uh, function of the AI Alliance was basically to be a sounding board for the high-level expert group. So the high-level expert group could post questions or when they published a report, they would basically be hoping to gain um, comments from the wider stakeholders. The AI Alliance is open for uh, basically anybody to join. Um, and it's more or less like a, a discussion forum. Uh, different parties, for instance, posted the types of uh, AI principles that were uh, being defined within their own organization uh, or talked about certain kinds of events where they would be discussing about these things or, as I said, would directly be responding to things that the high-level expert group had published. Now, the high-level expert group has completed its work um, and has been disbanded. The AI Alliance uh, still exists because this is a basically a forum of people, organizations engaged with AI, which the European Commission hopes to continue to use as a communications way to to you know, easily get some feedback on, on what they're doing. And also you're working in academia. Um, I, I, I don't know if, if you're lecturing or uh, research, so, so tell us a bit about that and also what the connection is between your, your as I said, your day job and the um, academic world. So I still maintain a, a toehold in academia. I'm still a 10% um, at the University of Nottingham as a senior research fellow there, which means it's like a um, associate professor, but purely in a research uh, form. So, so no teaching uh, role within that. Uh, and w basically, uh, over the since 2014, I was at the Horizon Digital Economy Research Institute at the University of Nottingham, which is focusing on really the uh, impacts of digital technologies on society. And that is really where I started moving from uh, the you know, technical development of AI kinds of technologies into more the ethics space. Uh, the Unbiased Project, for instance, which we ran there, was something that I initiated uh, when I was at a conference, I, which was most where I was mostly talking about the sort of the data collection side, the, the, the traditional privacy kinds of issues. But there were a lot of speakers talking about recommender systems they were building uh, and really during that conference i got triggered to thinking about but how are this this data that's collected about us it's actually being used to shape our experiences um, and so that's what triggered um, the idea of doing a, a project on bias and algorithmic systems focus very much on how do people actually understand these. So the Unbiased Project ended up being a co uh, collaboration between not the Universities of Nottingham, Oxford, and Edinburgh, um, and focusing on 17, uh, or 13 to 17 year olds. How do they experience their interaction with social media and with other online platforms that are using algorithms to, to, to mediate the kind of content you get? Do they understand what the algorithms are doing, why they're collecting this kind of data are there certain aspects that they are happy with or unhappy with or would like to have other kinds of control over very much the idea that the framing of the project was to get uh, an understanding from the young people in their own voice instead of having adults speaking to them and as we had a lot of with uh, internet education has been don't do this don't do that because everything is dangerous etc uh, it's more about understanding, you know, you are using these platforms, why are you using this? 
what do you like about what would you like to have different? And so that project led, uh, uh, my role within the project became very much one of doing the translating our research findings into recommendations for uh, policymakers and engaging with industry. And the recommendations for policymakers basically took the shape of uh, something like 14 submissions to parliamentary inquiries <laughs> in the UK, mm -hmm. um, as well as getting invited by the European Parliament to do a deeper uh, study report on a governance framework for algorithmic accountability and transparency. Um, the industry engagement uh, took the form primarily of working with the IEEE. So the IEEE, the Institute for Electrical and Electronic Engineers, um, launched a global initiative on ethics of autonomous intelligence systems uh, towards the end of 2016. Uh, and as part of that, uh, they were interested in starting development on industry standards related to uh, AI ethics. And so coming from the Unbiased Project, I took on the role to chair the um, Algorithmic Bias Considerations Working Group to develop a standard on algorithmic bias considerations for the IEEE. Which, by the way, was also how I then got into touch with EY and transitioned into EY because EY joined this working group and was interested in um, first having me do perhaps a one-day consulting to them and then gradually they thought actually we want to have somebody full time doing this so they invited me over. Uh, so that's sort of how the different parts connect to it and then one additional part to that as I said the Unbiased Project was focusing on 13 to 17 year olds so that work also then was strongly in collaboration with a um, with an NGO uh, called Five Rights, uh, which is around the rights of young people online. Effectively, the, the, the core idea behind it is that as a, as a child, you have certain particular rights and towards protection, which are recognized in the UN Charter for the Rights of Children. Um, you should remain being a child, whether you're offline or online, even though the way in which the online world is currently developed is by adult programmers who are just thinking about making apps for themselves, more or less. So the online world assumes that everybody... Well, the online world, um, initially at least, has been treating everybody equally, as in it's blind to who you are. But what it actually means is it treats everybody as if they are a um, Western, white, yeah. middle-class adult. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it doesn't recognize that other people have other requirements. Absolutely. So we've been working, I've also been working with that uh, NGO where I've uh, become a trustee a couple of years ago. Yeah. You're doing very important work for all of us, uh, Ansgar. Maybe the last thing I want to ask you about is, I think there are so many good initiatives and you've re referenced a number of them. But then you, on the other hand, you have the interests of nation states, the interests of large um, global corporations. And it's almost, I think, our fundamental um, human nature is to be territorial. Will we be working enough, or let me ask you this way, will we be working together enough to really rein this in for the future? Or are we going to lose control of it? And I assume it can go both ways, but what's your, your opinion on that? It is a, a, a difficult balancing act because on the one hand, a lot of these technologies are being used globally. A system gets developed in one place and then it gets rolled out everywhere. On the other hand, a lot of when we're talking about the ethics of AI systems is you need to be talking about who are the people who are going to be impacted by the system. Uh, what is the context in which you're using it? And the context is very different if you're deploying the system in uh, Western Europe or if you're deploying it uh, in, in somewhere as uh, South, Sah uh, South Saharan Africa or you're deploying it somewhere in Asia. Um, so you need to recognize that these systems have different requirements in different areas. And as such, you also actually need certain types of regulations need to be regional. They need to be in accordance with the local kind of context. On the other hand, all of these systems are interacting. So you need these different regional 
um, ways of regulating it to interact in a coherent way instead of clashing with each other. There are um, initiatives ongoing to, to try and make this happen. The OECD, for instance, is one of the leading organizations really on doing this intergovernmental international coordination through things like the, um, the Observatory for um, AI Policy. Um, it, OECD doesn't cover everybody, doesn't cover all countries, it's not the UN. The UN also has an interest going. UNESCO, for instance, is, is working also on an AI ethics guidelines. But in a sense, the further you go globally, the more the guidelines become fuzzy because you need to accommodate everybody. And then it becomes more challenging to say, but am I actually compliant with this? Because uh, the wording has become so vague that I don't really know what it means. We, at, at EY, for instance, what we hear a lot from, from companies is that they're a bit frustrated with the kinds of vagueness in the principles language that is coming down that say, yes, but what am I supposed to do? If I do this, can I be confident that I'm compliant with what they want us to be doing under these principles or not? Please give me more uh, concrete guidance. Um, so it's a very difficult um, part of our whole geopolitical interactions and obviously um, trade wars and those kinds of tensions don't help when it comes to this, but we need to work um, and, and really use, I think, the, the, the core values that are common across uh, everybody. Um, things like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights um, and we need to use the fact that um, academics and industry actually want to be collaborative with each other across countries. They don't, it's in nobody's interest really to splinter the internet or to work in silos. Um, so we need to use that kind of momentum to counter the, um, the other momentum of try everybody trying to be uh, you know, higher up on the pecking order than the next one. Um, it will be interesting times, and uh, we, I do my best to try and support the various in initiatives that are, are working to get us to cooperate more with each other. Sure. There's so many things we spoke about that I'm exceptionally interested in, Ansgo, so I definitely, in time, would like a, a follow-up conversation, and uh, I also wish you all the very best with the very important work you are doing it's, I mean, it's exciting stuff, but it's about our future and it's about our children's future. So, um, you know, um, I really wish you all the best and, and success. And, and so